yesterday dropped newspapers. Um, one of our campaigns is Stop the Jew Hatred on campus. Uh, UCLA is one of many schools. We're targeting 10 schools. This is a sample of the newspaper that we're uh, blanketing these campuses, and we highlight the anti cases of anti-Semitism on a number of campuses, UCLA being uh, the focal point here. Uh, we're going to be at Santa Cruz, Stanford, University of Minnesota, uh, Nevada, Reno, Columbia, Tufts, and a number of other schools. Um, anti-Semitism, as I think we all know, uh, it's always been kind of, on, you know, in, in America, at least recently, it always been on the fringe, either radical Islam or the neo-Nazis. Unfortunately, Jew hatred is becoming very mainstream. It's in our culture. I think we see it more and more in uh, politics, particularly with the Democrat Party. Um, but it has become very prevalent, we see it in, again in Hollywood and the culture. And I think uh, anti-Semitism is a pernicious disease. It's like a cancer. And once it takes hold of the host, it just spreads. And we are doing everything we can to stop it. I think it's out of control. It's not going to get better unless we fight it. And we have to fight it with the truth. This is a copy of the poster that we are putting out, uh, equating the Nazi flag with the Palestinian flag. Um, we find that much of what the Palestinians believe in is very similar to what Nazi Germany believe in. So this is the kind of, this is David. He's the fighter, fight fire with fire. We are going to fight Jew hatred with everything that we can and call it what it is. Um, so thank you for all your support of this campaign and all of our campaigns. I'm going to ask Lonnie Leiker to come up. Uh, he's a Minnesotan, as our speaker Pete Hexeth is. So I'm going to turn it over to the Minnesota part of the program. Ladies and gentlemen, Lonnie Knight Leiker. <laughs> By the way, as an introduction, Lonnie runs our campus campaign. So I, I, don't, I don't know if you're at UCLA. I, I don't want to give away any secrets. But he, he's instrumental in all of our campaigns. Thank you. Yeah, I did shower for a couple days and put on a baseball hat and walk around East LA and uh, put the papers out. It was great. Uh, um, didn't get the measles too. I got the vaccine. Um, but uh, Pete Hicks, uh, a lot of you know, he spoke a couple years ago at our West Coast retreat. But for those of you who don't know him but probably recognize his face, is a co-host of Fox and Friends Weekend and a frequent guest host for the weekday edition of Fox and Friends, the highest rated cable morning show in America. Uh, he is also a Fox News senior political analyst, uh, providing analysis and commentary across Fox News and Fox business programs. Pete is also the author of a highly acclaimed book, In the Arena, which is at your chair, uh, which was published uh, in May of 2016. He's interviewed President Trump a few times at those uh, rallies, and I love your Instagram, you know, following the president uh, down the back hallways, which is always fun. Uh, before Pete got to Fox News, uh, he was an Army veteran of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and was also a guard at Guantanamo Bay, or Club Gitmo, as Rush likes to call it. He holds two bronze stars and a, a, and a combat infantry badge for his time in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. In 2012, Captain Hakeseth deployed to Afghanistan with the Minnesota Army National Guard, where he was the senior counterinsurgency instructor at the Counterinsurgency Insurgency Training Center in Kabul. Before that, First Lieutenant Hakeseth deployed to Iraq with the 3rd Brigade of the 101st Airborne Division for their 2005-2006 tour, serving as an infantry platoon leader in Baghdad in 2005, and as a civil military operations officer in Samara in 2006. A year before that, 2nd Lieutenant at the time, uh, served in Quindanovo Bay with his New Jersey Army National Guard unit, 2004-2005. Uh, Pete was recently promoted to the rank of major and is, cr and is currently in the individual ready reserve. Pete is, yes. <laughs> Pete is the former CEO of Concerned Veterans for America, where he built the largest conservative veterans advocacy organization in America and led for the charge for real reform at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Before that, he was the executive director of Vets for Freedom, uh, leading the ground truth, as they like to call it, charge for success on the battlefield in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
He graduated from Princeton University, where David is never allowed to go, <laughs> in 2003 with an undergraduate degree in politics. While at Princeton, Peeps was also a member of the varsity basketball team and an Army ROTC cadet. And I think this is really cool. This might haunt you if you ever run for political office someday. He was the publisher of the campus conservative publication. What was it called? The Princeton for the Princeton Tory. <laughs> Pete uh, completed a master's degree in public policy at Harvard University, uh, John F. Kennedy School of Government, uh, and graduated in 2013. Impressive resume, but uh, I think his uh, proudest thing on his resume is Pete is the father to four young children, Gunnar, Boone, Rex, and Gwendolyn, who he prays will someday be in the arena like himself for God and country. Aww. Everybody, please welcome my friend Pete Hanson. Lonnie is a great friend of mine. Uh, thank you so much for that generous introduction. I am actually very familiar, after my Princeton Tory times, of running around campus at night putting flyers up. <laughs> we did a lot of that guerrilla stuff at Princeton. It was after 9-11 when I was an undergraduate. Uh, there was a lot of uh, protesting of the war that hadn't even started yet. Uh, and as a small town boy from Minnesota, I was not prepared for the leftism that I saw on campus, but we fought back as hard as we could. It may haunt me, but who cares? I don't think I'm, in, I don't think I'm invited back to Princeton either. I'm probably not welcome there. Uh, I just want to thank the Freedom Center. What an amazing organization. I am an admirer of the work that you do, fighting fire with fire, being aggressive about truth, about what really matters. Uh, so I'm honored to be here, always will come when invited, and so grateful uh, for what David does uh, and for what all of you do in supporting his mission. It is, uh, as, as part of what I'll talk about today, it's part of the front lines of fighting for Western civilization and for freedom. So today I was asked to talk about Trump's America First foreign policy. Uh, I could talk probably, like many of you, for three hours on this subject. I'll keep it till 20 or so, and then we'll take some Q&A. Um, I want to start with three sort of stark truths. One is that history is not over. That's true. <laughs> we don't get to hit pause. Remember the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire and the Arab Empire, the original caliphate, the Mongol Empire, the British Empire. There were times and moments when people thought they were the future of world history. History is not over. The second is that America is not inevitable. You all know the quote from Ronald Reagan, freedom is never more than one generation from extinction. You don't pass it to the next generation in the bloodstream. You have to fight for it. America is exceptional, but we are not invincible. Uh, ultimately, we are an American experiment. Experiment in human freedom that's never been tried before. The history of great republics, the few that have been, the average lifespan is 225 to 275 years before they eat themselves from within. We're roughly 240 years old. In some ways, we're on borrowed time. Uh, I think a lot of us have taken for granted for a long time, not this group, but most of America, that America is indeed inevitable. And the third truth, and you can take this to the bank, is that if the 21st century is not an American-led century, the 21st century will not be a free century. There is nowhere else to sail to. That's it. It's America or nobody else. Who are we going to hand it to? See, after World War II, our, our friends, the Brits, took a knee, exhausted by two world wars, and effectively handed stewardship to the free world to their younger cousin, the Americans. If we took a knee, as we are, as some would like us to, who do we hand that stewardship to? Communist Chinese? Vladimir Putin? Islamists? International organizations? How about Europe? When you open your borders and gut your military to pay for your welfare states, and then you do not demand assimilation and allegiance, you get a museum. You get an irrelevant continent, for the most part, especially Western Europe, incapable of defending its own values, therefore incapable of leadership on the global stage. It is America or nobody else. That is the lens through which we have to understand the discussion of American power and American foreign policy. So 
So I'm going to give my spin and interpretation on America First foreign policy. I think there's six ingredients, or six things that must be done. One, remember, they all start with R. One is remember. Two is rear guard action. I'll explain what that is. Three is reevaluate. Four is reload. Five is radically recalibrate. And six, I'm not going to tell you till the end. Because I, I do television, and a good tease, it's worth, it's worth his weight in gold. Can't give everything up front. Uh, the first, first R is remember. It is by far the most important aspect of preserving American power and leadership in foreign policy. A hollow civic or cultural core leads to the inability to project the values and interest in force that is required, especially when you sustain setbacks. If you don't believe in yourself, you will not have an ability to defend yourself. Just as radical Islam has been ascendant, Western culture, Western culture, Western civilization has decided to eat itself that it no longer believes in itself anymore. The first part of that is education. I think as patriots, as conservatives, if you consider yourself a Republican, whatever it is, issue A number one is education. Across the board. I don't know if you have kids or grandkids in public school right now, elementary school, junior high, high school, do you know if they say the Pledge of Allegiance? At all? Most public schools don't anymore. God's long since been ripped out of our public schools. Uh, the biggest you know, celebration day on the calendar is often Earth Day. It'll mention Patriots Day, Veterans Day, Memorial Day, all the days on the calendar that President's Day, how dare you talk about President's Day? Washington and Lincoln and the like, they were slave owners. We don't celebrate them anymore. When you forget who you are and you don't teach that, why are we shocked when we have generations of kids who don't love America, who are seduced by socialism? How are you supposed to maintain the idea of American power and leadership and exceptionalism if you don't believe in your own country? If we don't take back education, we are going to lose our country. A, number one, foreign policy becomes an afterthought, an exercise of elites shuffling cards if the American people don't believe in the country that they have. It's a big part of what I wrote about in the book, In the Arena. You gotta remember that America is an exceptional country. Why we're exceptional? What our founders gave us, that's all part of education. That we're an idea, people that came together around the idea of free people, Rights endowed by a creator, not by a government. If you don't understand that, you're seduced by the Leviathan of big government. Right. If you don't believe in something greater than yourself, uh, in faith, then you're rejecting what our founders understood. Without an individual moral compass of faith, of a shared cultural fabric, then you need government to step in and tell you how you will live. Then you redistribute income. Then you reject capitalism and free markets. Uh, in understanding of Western civilization. I believe the state of Israel and the Jewish people are the front lines of Western civilization. And I... I almost had a Jeb Bush moment and said, you can clap for that. I visited there many times. I just have a documentary out at Fox Nation called Battle in the Holy City. It's about Jerusalem, the ongoing struggle for Jerusalem. And what most people don't know is it is, in, in, in Jerusalem today, it is full-out temple denial. What the Palestinians, the Arabs, the Muslims are saying. I had an interview to sit down with, sat down with the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. He's the head of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. I don't think he knew who I was. Uh, and you remember, this is the same Mufti who allied himself, well, not the same one, but the same position that allied himself with Hitler in World War II. And he looked me in the eye over the course of a 30-minute uh, conversation in a highly uh, Arab neighborhood and said the Temple Mount was never there. David was never there, Solomon was never there, King Herod never built the Temple, Jesus was never there. This is an Islamic holy site only. City of David's a lie, the Western Wall is a lie, Western Wall tunnels are a lie. And with a straight face, as I brought evidence after evidence to refute his claim, said absolutely, and we heard that time and time again, in fact, the Arab and Palestinians that we interviewed for that special on camera would deny any Jewish claims to the Temple Mount. And then off camera they'd say, well of course there's Jewish claims to the Temple Mount. I can't say they're all be killed. 
these are the types of things that the left and the Islamists are doing to rewrite and erase history. And if we do not educate our kids and our country about these things, we will lose them over time. Just like the Holocaust, the understanding of what was done to the Jewish people. So Western civilization, whether it's where it lives in America, in Israel, with the Brexiters, with countries in Eastern Europe that truly understand it, nationalism, meaning American nationalism, American, Americanism, and faith. Faith in God, faith in Jesus Christ for me, faith uh, in God, faith in, 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 in the Judeo-Christian values of our country are something we have to remember and infuse in the next generation intentionally. Civic ritual, parades, moments, teaching your kids, all of those things are important. So you thought you were going to hear about foreign policy, you will, but without all of that, it becomes this academic exercise that isn't rooted in something meaningful. If we had to muster the American people again to truly meet a challenge, you can't muster people that don't believe in their own country. So that's number one, remember. The second is a rear guard action. Now what is a rear guard action? It's a military term. That part of a military force that protects from attack from the rear or from within. I think the Freedom Center is, a, is on the front lines of fighting that rear guard action. The enemy is already here. The enemy is already amongst us. People with values very different than ours infiltrate our universities, our culture, our churches, our synagogues, our mosques, are different with a different agenda than holding up what America values. Uh, it's part of what the president fights for. Think about the idea of borders and illegal immigration. He says if you don't have borders, you don't have a country. If you don't have borders, you don't have a country. That is a fact, but to the left today, no person is illegal, and they truly believe in open borders. And the fact that it is, it is so 20th and 19th century to define your border. We have to fight back with the same energy that he does on things like that. Anti-Semitism, of course. What was just talked about up here, my new friend Michael said, don't call it anti-Semitism, use the right words, it's you hatred. Be honest about what it is. Tackle it straight on, because if you start to lose those debates, you're losing the rear guard action. Islamism, the idea of assimilation and allegiance. Listen, I'm from Minnesota. I grew up right next to, to St. Paul in Minneapolis. I'm from, very familiar with Keith Ellison. I'm very familiar with Ilhan Omar. I'm very familiar with the large uh, Somali Muslim population in our state. Now listen, I will say this and I say it every time. If you come to our country, I don't care what your religion or skin color is, if you want to love my state and love my country and be a part of that fabric, then you are welcome. So if I make, when I make these statements and make this argument, you can call me whatever you want, but I know I'm not a racist, and I know I'm not a xenophobe, and I know I'm not an Islamophobe, and all of those things. I'm an American. If you want to come here, invest in the language, invest in the community, invest in our values, Invest in, in all the things that have made us great from the beginning. But if you're going to reject that, if you're not going to learn the language, if you're not going to assimilate, if you're, not, if you're going to demand welfare benefits in return uh, for being here, if you're going to come as a refugee, as Ilhan Omar did, she came as a refugee after the civil war in Somalia, brought from a refugee camp by a generous country to Lutheran charities. God bless the Lutherans. I grew up Lutheran, but you know... They, their whole idea is charity with welfare benefits come here. If we give all that, and then we, we, we spend on public schools, and we make sure that needs are met, and then you turn around and say, America was never great, or I never experienced the prosperity that I was, that I was supposed to get. Where I come from, that's just plain old ungrateful. And unwilling to be honest about the special place that is America that would take a woman who came to America not speaking English, hold her up, educate her, and then elect her to Congress. Duly elected. So I think arguing for assimilation and allegiance to the country is central to, to, to maintaining this country. Socialism. Teaching capitalism. Teaching free markets. If we don't teach free markets to kids, they're going to think free stuff works. Because I call her Comrade Cortez. I don't even like to... The freshman congresswoman from the Bronx, who's actually from Westchester. She says she's never experienced prosperity. And 
I, you want to turn around and say, is there an iPhone in your hand? Because there's more technology in that iPhone created in America than the, than the folks that went to the moon the first time on their space shuttle. American innovation has lifted more boats than any other country in human history around the world, and full stop. If you don't teach kids that, if our universities teach socialism or redistribution, then they start to think capitalism is evil. Political correctness, God bless our president's assault on political correctness. Uh, I mean, I, the first time I ever met him, I'll tell a quick story. I was interviewing for the VA secretary job. I never met him before, he was president-elect. So I'm at Trump Tower. And I, I had been a Marco Rubio supporter at first, and a Cruz supporter, and then, and then fully a Trump supporter. And I can tell that story, but that's not for today. And I walk into his, of course, he knows all that. So I walk into his office, Ryan Supremus walks me in, and he goes, um, yeah, I walk up, there's a president behind his desk, he goes, first word he says, Pete, at the very beginning, who were you for? <laughs> I wasn't really ready for that. And I was like, Mr. President, I was from Marco Rubio because he's good on vets issues. He goes, oh, little Marco. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of laughed, you know, and he, and he looks over at Reince and he goes, weren't those nicknames great, Reince? <laughs> little Marco, line 10, crooked. <laughs> and, and I said, I stopped him for a second, didn't really interrupt, just interject, and I said, well, Mr. President, I gotta say my favorite. Nicknames, Pocahontas. He goes, a lot of people tell me that. <laughs> a lot of people. <laughs> and the reason I say that is then he launched into about a two-minute expose of why she's a fraud. And the left will say, oh, he's a racist because he says Pocahontas. No, 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 no. He is the most effective marketer we've ever seen. He got to the heart of the issue of the deception she used to benefit herself and did it with a really effective nickname. And that's why they hate it so much, because it's effective. So using those words, he's like, a, he's like a shield for us. It's the Trump shield. If Trump is willing to say it from his podium with all the slings and arrows he gets, then we better be willing to as well. And he's opened an avenue where you can speak, because if they control the language, the words you can say, they control everything. Now, I won't even get into the media. That's the other part. We're fighting our fight as best we can. Uh, on, on that, but Europe is the lesson of utopia that they say they were going to get versus a preview of what we will get if we don't educate and have effective rear guard operations. So what you're doing here is huge in calling out the elements of our society which are blatantly anti-American, blatantly anti-Israel, and blatantly anti-Western civilization. So thank you guys, the Freedom Center, for everything you do in that part. So it's remember, let's see what did I just say, rear guard, and then <laughs> reevaluate our foreign policy. I think this is super important. I was talking to a gentleman outside about this. As a veteran of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, fully invested in those outcomes. I mean, I was, we were one of the leaders of the uh, fighting for the Iraq surge, which was so successful in what was done there. That you know Joe Biden, when he was vice president in 2010? This is 2010, this is after the surge, after uh, Obama had been reelected. He said Iraq, would be one of the biggest foreign policy successes of the Obama administration. It was such a consensus that the American military had turned the tide, created an opportunity, totally crushed the Islamists, that they believed it would be a success for America. And they said it openly. Well, then they retreated from the battlefield, and there came ISIS, and we got what we got. My own journey from 9-11 to Guantanamo Bay to Iraq and Afghanistan, I think is, it's not unique. Men, did, men and women did many more things than I did, made more tours than I did, saw more combat than I did, all of those things. But I had a chance at the front row, in, on the battlefield and in Washington, to watch how those wars developed, and also in the court of public opinion. And if you step back right now as an objective observer and feel like the Middle East is in a better place than it was in 2001, you are not correct. Uh, and that's not to blame America. That's, we have to look at it look at it once again through the lens of our interests and our values and reevaluate how we address that. We were not correct to think that we could nation build and remake Afghanistan. It's like biblical times with AK-47s and cell phones. They were never gonna have a national central government. I saw it there in 2011 and 2012 when I was in charge of units coming in and training them about what was actually happening, understanding the tribal dynamics, 
the insurgency, the Taliban, the shadow governments that were set up, it was already an endgame. But we spent the next seven or eight years pretending like we were winning because that's what politicians often want to do. And then we surged. Remember when Obama surged in Afghanistan? And then the next day, with the same speech, he told them when we're going to leave. Which means it was an utterly ineffective exercise from the very beginning. We have to realize what's possible and not possible in the Middle East. I actually think a better outcome was possible in Iraq if we'd actually followed through. But there was a there was a lot of us thought you could remake that place, not understanding it as well as you should. We have to be willing to be honest about what's been achieved or not achieved without throwing the war fighters or their wars under the bus. And that's what the left always wants to do. I, love, I hate the war, but I love the war fighter. I think you, you, you disparage the war fighter by undercutting what they fought for. Uh, it's a balance between interests and values. I think we should and must stand for both, but we have to be clear. Uh, sometimes a dictator who's on our side is better than opening a society up to democracy that isn't ready for it. Because who wins every time we do that? The, the Islamists. Look in Egypt, look in Gaza, look around, look in, look in uh, Iraq and Syria, what happens inside a vacuum. If they're not prepared for freedom, you can't give it to them. They have to want it and be willing to fight for it. Venezuela will be very interesting to watch. So we were all watching that on TV today. The other reevaluation is something Trump has done very well. Look at the post-World War II model and whether or not it serves American interests anymore. We won a world war and then we set up a system through the UN, through the WTO, through the Security Council, through NATO that was built to defend American interests in the Western order. Did a very good job for a long time. Unfortunately, systems age, interests change, alignments change, and if you cling to an alliance or you cling to an institution because it's always been there, you can start clinging to something that's antithetical to your own interests. Look at the UN today. It is a cesspool of anti-Semitism and anti-Americanism. It's what it is. Look at the Human Rights Commission headed up by the Iranians and whoever else has been in charge of that commission. It's a joke, and it doesn't serve our interests. Thankfully, this administration, Nikki Haley and others, have taken it on. I will say later that I think we need to do more. Look at his indictment of NATO. Turkey is a member of NATO. Erdogan wants to rebring bring back the caliphate. Right. He is meddling against every single one of our interests. He wants, he wants Russia's missiles in our jets. In what world does that make any sense? And then you've got all these countries in Europe who because they've gutted their militaries to pay for welfare states, they don't have any militaries. We are, the United States military is the military of Europe. Make no mistake about it. I've been in, in Afghanistan, in NATO, where there were 50 members of the coalition, 50, all these flags at headquarters. We had Mongolians on our base. You know what they did with the Humvees we gave them? They drove from their, where they lived to the Chahal, and then back from the Chahal to where they lived. They were a member of the coalition. We wore patches that said ISAF, uh, International Security Assistance Force. You know what we call them? I saw Americans fighting. <laughs> Because that's what it was. It's not a real alliance if they won't fight with you. It doesn't count. Someday we'll need a real alliance. And if you have a paper alliance, you have nothing. So for Trump to call them out and say, if you don't spend, then we're not going to defend you. It's the tough love these guys need. Either you're going to live in history, either you're going to live in history, or you're going to be irrelevant. And it's not our job to defend you. We'd like it if you defend yourselves, but that's not our job, that's your job. And your politicians have bungled it. Thankfully, some of them have welcomed up, woken up, like the Brexiteers and Nigel Farage, and some of those who actually clamor for sovereignty and relevance in the 21st century. But that is a model that needs to be challenged. Same with international trade, the WTO. All these trade agreements that we agreed to, with no understanding of how they're gonna affect our people, our industries. And we go along because the elites tell us that it's all about globalization and internationalization. There's a difference between globalism and globalization. Globalization is a reality. We live in a globally interconnected world. There is no doubt about that. Globalism says that's automatically a good thing. And automatically that should be the, the default setting. That's what the elites in this country, Republicans and Democrats, believe in. Trump showed up and said, no, how about America first? How about my citizens first? And deals that work for them.
The other thing we need to reevaluate re is clarity. Like, we have friends and we have enemies. Obama reversed them. Trump's job is to be clear. Israel is our eternal and ongoing, no bending ally, friend, no better friend. <laughs> Iran? No, we're going to do everything we can to undermine. They hate us, they hate Israel, they would destroy us both if they could. They are the most nefarious force across the Middle East and, and around the world, next to China. Not to mention China. What was the consensus of the global elites for a couple of decades, the Clinton era and the Bush era? That China, because it was economically liberalized, because it was opening up their markets, that would inevitably lead to political liberalization, meaning freedom for their people. They'll, they'll get new gadgets and new stuff because of the free markets, and therefore they'll, they will throw out or reject their political leaders. What has happened? The exact opposite. They've used those mar open market openings to enrich the government to further suppress their people and become more powerful. That we know. So call it a rivalry, call it a showdown, call it what you want, China is not our friend. So when Trump looks at these trade deals, when we look at the South China Sea, when they look at their Belt and Road Initiative and what they're doing in South America, we have to just be honest about that and confront them where required. They're still not bigger than us, they're still not badder than us, they're still afraid of us. Now is the time for us to leverage that, to push them back before they get so cavalier that they became more of a regional hegemon and seem to be a global power. This administration understands that trade's a big part of it. I think something like the Monroe Doctrine, with the old Roosevelt corollary, you know the Monroe Doctrine was preventing uh, European colonization and uh, puppet monarchs in, in the Western Hemisphere, and then Teddy Roosevelt came around and said, yeah, in order to enforce that, we'll use a big stick if we have to. I think recognizing our spheres of influence and interests might be something we have to revisit again. Uh, and, and think about, because China, rather than focus billions and trillions and lives and effort inside the Middle East, hoping to remake a society that ain't gonna happen, when you could come alongside alternative forms of government, strong men maybe, and then, enrip, and then build up our energy industry here so we don't have, they don't even have to rely on them so much, mm -hmm. and then refocus on the places where we are under the greatest threat. I mean, right now, it's, it's the Chinese, it's the Islamists, and frankly, it's the globalists. It's those who seek to undermine sovereignty uh, and, 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 and strip that away through international institutions that don't ever serve the interests of the people and always serve these amorphous ideas of, of a better humanity. Uh, Roosevelt, uh, Roosevelt once in the book, he said, uh, global citizens are, because global citizenship is what they teach in schools today, by the way. Global citizenship. And Roosevelt said, global citizens are utterly, undesir utterly undesirable citizens of their own country because they love the idea of humanity more than they love their neighbor or their community or their country. Exactly. It's easy to, like, I love all humans until someone comes up to you and says, well, would you like to take a Syrian refugee into your house? Yeah. And they're like, no, thank you. It's very easy to virtue signal to talk about humanity as opposed to stand up for values that are tried and true and tested and have to be fought for. Uh, so those are all the types of things that we need to reevaluate. Look at the wars we had, don't fight the last war. Look at what's coming ahead. So if you've reevaluated your foreign policy, then you gotta reload. Because we have been at war for a couple of decades and we have spent a lot of money and we have sent a lot of the same guys and gals time and time and time and time and time and time again. Part of that is ensuring they get the care they deserve at the VA when they come home. God bless what this president has done on opening up choice for veterans. If you want a preview of what single payer Medicare for all healthcare is gonna be, just look at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, he's right to fight for accountability, he's right to fight for choice. It's not fixed yet by any measure, but the minute the bureaucracy has to fight for a vet as a customer, as opposed to treat them as a number, that's when you have a chance to change a culture. Uh, and as free market folks, we understand that's the only way to defeat bureaucracies that are inherently self-serving. So Obama, you know, Teddy Roosevelt said, speak softly and carry a big stick. Obama said, speak softly and get rid of your stick. <laughs> and I think Trump is, speak loudly and carry a big old stick. <laughs> Which I would much prefer. Yeah. You know, rebuild your economy. You can't reload if you don't have an economy that's going gangbusters. Thank God this president understands tax cuts and, 
and uh, regulate, regulatory reform has unleashed that. You need energy to do that, and what they've done with the energy renaissance, natural gas, oil, everything else in this country is absolutely fundamental to America's rebound and, and, and strength in the world. That's why it's, the, the religion of climate change for the left is so dangerous. I mean, it's a religion for them. 100%. Alongside being taught about global citizenship, they are taught that global climate change is irrefutably true. And as Comrade Cortez says, the world's going to end in 12 years, this is World War III. That is their mindset. That is their mindset. And as a result, that's what makes what we're doing with energy right now so important, but we have to stay very focused. And of course our military. You got a weapon. War is going to space, whether we like it or not. Weaponizing space, either we get there first or the Chinese do. What do we want? What do we choose? Uh, that's why the Space Force, which the left likes to deride, is actually an incredibly serious concept. Uh, much like Reagan was dismissed for SDI, Trump's uh, dismissed for something that's extremely important. Weaponizing the digital space, um, you know, so those Russians don't elect President Trump again. Hey, Russia, if you're out there, do it again. It's, that whole thing is so unbelievable. Not the topic of my discussion tonight, but you hear about it all the time. Tonight, it feels like tonight, it's today. Uh, and then conventional forces, you need more troops, you need more ships, you need the next generation fighters, you need the, the nuclear submarines that can deliver uh, you know, tactical nuclear weapon capabilities, you need all of the hypersonic weapons, all the things that we know we need, you have to invest in. The, the idea of soft power, which the Obama administration used to talk about, is really just, we're just gonna get weaker and then try to figure it out. That's what's soft and smart power is usually very, very dumb. Uh, so you reload. Then the fifth, the fifth aspect is radical, radically recalibrate. I don't know if I'm just getting more radical as I get older or maybe more cognizant of the, 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 the reality, the threat that we face, but it's gonna take a big old reorientation and reversal of our country. Goldwater, Barry Goldwater once said, extremism in defense of liberty is no vice. I would say that extremism in defense of Americanism is no vice. It is necessary. We have to be willing to go back to what our founders understood about human freedom and, and be able to explain away, easily and quickly dismiss away the sins of the past of another era and point to what America has done, what they represented, and the human freedom that we've had and led the way on for 240 years. It's not hard, I'm not, that's not the point of the speech today. Stand confident in who we are, because what we're not, what we're litigating right now is not like marginal tax rates over here and a little bit more health care over here. It's like, do you stand for the anthem or not? Like, do we have borders or do we not have borders? Do we support the cops or not support the cops? Do we rebuild the military or, or let it fizzle? Do we stand for free markets or socialism? Like, that's where we're at. This is an existential moment. What do you gotta do? You gotta have an educational disruption. You gotta, if, if public schools won't change, you gotta leave them. And you know what, we have a problem in public schools. It's the same thing with members of Congress. Everyone says, man, I can't stand Congress, but I like my local congressman, he's a nice guy. Same thing with public education. Public education, common core, indoctrination, but my local high school is so great. I know the principal, he's nice, I know the teachers, they're nice, guess what? Edu federal education is being rammed down the throats of every public school in America. Patriotic schools, conservative communities, any of those, they're getting the same garbage. I mean, my, I come from a very conservative uh, middle class town in Minnesota, where I love it. Tons of veterans, very patriotic. And I remember when I was, my, my kid brother was in high school, I must have been, I don't know, I don't know how old I was, 30. And they were showing an inconvenient truth through the whole school on Earth Day. Do you think it's getting better? It's only getting worse. They are indoctrination camps. You have, we have to wake ourselves up that our, the schools our kids and our grandkids go to are not teaching kids basic civics. They're not teaching kids to love America. They're not teaching kids patriotism. And the math they teach them is crap. Right. I can't do my kids third grade math. It's like, I don't know what happened to like carrying the one and long division, but it's all gone. You, we have to wake up to that reality. And I don't know if that's homeschooling with co-ops. I don't know if that's starting our own schools uh, that, are, that are classical schools, patriotic schools, in higher education, in schools like College of the Ozarks, which I recently got to uh, spend a lot of time visiting, like Hillsdale, like Liberty, like schools like that, that where kids work hard and they're taught uh, faith and they're taught civics and the Constitution 
and they come out as people prepared to further the American experiment. 99% of our universities do the exact opposite. And we seed that ground. And then the culture reinforces it, and then the media reinforces it, and then social media reinforces it, and then we wonder why they like burning. We have to be willing to be disruptors in education. We gotta abandon the UN. See ya. We're out. NATO no longer serves the purpose that it should. Something like a freedom league of, of, of people that actually, countries that actually have militaries, that actually share our values, that would be willing to go to war with us shoulder to shoulder as opposed to on paper is the type of thing that we should revisit as opposed to clinging to old alliances that do some good but aren't ready to meet the, the threats that we may need in the 21st century. Uh, we need to, be, as I said before, we need to revisit the balance between values and interests. Sometimes our interests are better served by a strong man or someone or woman around the world who will clamp down on Islamists in their midst, shut down the Muslim Brotherhood, go after ISIS. Doesn't mean they're wonderful people, but it means the world's a better place when ISIS isn't, isn't in power and when the Muslim Brotherhood isn't in power. And then I think we have to demand patriotism. I really believe that. There used to be a day where journalists were patriotic. Remember, they would like not disclose information because it might hurt the troops on the battlefield or might undermine uh, an effort or a program we had in a certain department of a three-letter agency that we don't talk about. No, now all of our journalists are, are uh, you know, they're leftists. I mean, jump into any newsroom or cable news network in New York City and throw a rock into a newsroom and I dare you to try to hit a conservative. <laughs> you couldn't do it. You couldn't, except for Fox News Channel. You couldn't do it. Uh, that is why what the president has said about fake news media is dead on. That's why they hate it so much, because they know who they are. Uh, but we should be demanding patriotism of our journalists. We should be demanding patriotism of corporations. You know, Nigel Farage talks a lot about inter multinational corporations. They benefit from the policies of domestically, and then they enrich themselves internationally and don't uphold our values in the process. If borders matter, then allegiance of companies matter as well. Twitter, Facebook, all these social media companies uh, happily benefit from the fertile ground of America, but then advance, they, 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 they adhere to censor codes in China, or they oppress minority groups in other countries. What is this all about? Either we're in this together or we're not. And I think that this is a moment President Trump is doing it to have that conversation. We obviously have to take our gloves off the military. The rules of engagement that get people killed, where we put our own guys in jail. You may have seen the stories on Fox, whether it's Matt Goldstein, Green Beret, Eddie Gallagher, Navy SEAL, Clint Lorenz, a first lieutenant who made a tough call on the battlefield. He's been in jail for seven years, a 20 year sentence. Oh my. I could have been, I mean, he made the same kind of decisions guys like me made. If I make a different decision in that moment, I could be Clinton Rents. And yet our government prosecutes, oftentimes hides evidence, because bureaucracies inside the Army or the Navy, elsewhere, exist to defend themselves, get very political, and throw war fighters under the bus. The president is changing this, but if we're going to defeat the enemies of the future, we can't kill people compassionately. There's no such thing as compassionate combat. Either you close with and destroy the enemy, or you shouldn't be there to begin with. And that's part of the reason why these wars go on so long, is because you either have to be ready to nation build for like 100 years. When McCain said that, we'll be in Iraq for 25, 50, 100 years, he was technically right. Your enemy has to believe you will stay long enough to generationally finish the job. I'm just telling you as someone who's studied insurgencies and counterinsurgencies, it's all mental. Because if the enemy, if your enemy believes that you're here not to stay that long, then they just whisper in the ear of the population. And they say, the Americans will be gone soon. And when they are, we'll remember who you stood with. You know, the old Taliban adage, uh, the Americans have the watches, but we have the time. And if we're not invested with a long-term perspective, then we're just wasting our time in most of these places. So you either do that, or you go in and kill them. You go in with everything, you, <laughs> you do what you gotta do, and then you get the heck out. Or you make sure there's a viable security force afterward to clean up the red, the remnants, you stay to clean up the remnants, but you go in all in, all out, and you don't pretend like you're gonna remake that society. Yeah. Uh, the last one on, on radically recalibrate, it's not even radical recalibration, it's just we better stand for the Second Amendment. Yes. And what it represents. I love when Republicans go through the phase of, well, the Second Amendment is for hunting. It's like, no, you moron. Our founders understood 
that when people, in this, when a citizenry are disarmed, the government can do whatever it wants. We still live in history. When, a arms, when there is an armed citizenry, there is a check on what governments can and cannot do. And that's not a call for revolution, that's not a call for militias, that's a common sense recognition of what the Second Amendment was always meant to represent. Uh, we better defend that, just like the First Amendment, every way that we can. The sixth point, the sixth R, which I've held back on till the end here, is the best one, and most important, we better re-elect Trump in 2020. Yeah. often, every generation says it, every election says it, but uh, this feels like as big of an election as we will ever, ever have. Think about what they did. They didn't take him seriously for the first, you know, year of his candidacy. Then they ran a terrible candidate against him, and then they spent the last two and a half years trying to undo what happened in November of 2016. It is their fault. They ran a terrible candidate. I will say that in 2020, they're not going to make the same mistake. Um, they're going to rally behind whomever it is. I think, I personally think it might be Bernie, but we'll see. Could be Biden if they figure it out. And they will use every organ at their disposal to destroy Trump and discredit anyone who would ever support him. Uh, I asked Newt Gingrich yesterday, I did a book event with him in New York City before I flew here, and I said, it almost feels, you know, we're on different planets. It almost feels like, you know, there's, there are irreconcilable differences between leftists and conservatives in America today. Um, how does this end? Does this end with clash? Does this end with divorce? What is like this end? One side wins. And 2020 might be the moment where if America, because I mean, the question, the existential question is, is President Trump's election and or re-election a last gasp of patriots, many of which are getting older, who love America, and still hold power in the political sway, because we've lost power in high schools and colleges and media and social media and corporations that are now all about cultural Marxism or social justice, however you want to call it. We've lost all of those, we've lost our churches for the most part, but we still hold political sway because there are still patriots who vote, who understand why America is so great. In 20 years, unfortunately, many of those folks won't be with us. What does the electorate look like? Are we the last gasp? Or is this part of a cultural renewal? Or, or even after all the fake news, all the Democrats, all the Republicans, the bureaucracy, the deep state, they came at him with everything they had, and America still comes out and votes for him. Is that a recognition that this is a reservoir of goodness and patriotism and faith in the American people? So I'll close by saying, I, I wrote the book in the arena because I think a lot of people feel like, you know, what can I do? The problems are so big. And I don't have the same, same kind of power as this person or that person. And I don't have the ability to go on Fox and say, the point of in the arena, the message that Teddy Roosevelt had in that historic speech, Teddy Roosevelt did, he went off the deep end late in his career, but forget that. The speech he gave that the book is centered on is, is incredible articulation of American values. Is that we each have our own arena. And we have a choice whether we get in it or not. And it could be it could be carrying a rifle and being in the military. It could be a patriotic school teacher. It could be a patriotic journalist. It could be leading a civic group, starting a group, running for office, running for school board, being a stay-at-home mother who teaches kids to be good citizens. Uh, it could be being a member of the clergy that actually teaches the Bible. Uh, you know, things like that are part of being in the arena. And Roosevelt argued that great republics stay great when they have good citizens. That's true. It's individual good citizens that, that ultimately are the end state of great republics. So it's on you, it's on me, to be in the arena every day unafraid. And when a guy like Trump in office, we better be unafraid at this yeah. point. And I'll end by saying this. I used to say to my kids, uh, and, and groups when I would speak, I would say, you know, I fought so that you won't have to. I fought so that you, you hopefully won't have to. And it's a comfy platitude. And I think it was once true uh, in that like, when the World War II generation came back, like if you go for four years and you beat the Nazis, you come home to your kids and you say, like, take a break. I fought so that hopefully you won't have to. That's the sentiment, the, the, the idea, is you fight for perpetual peace for that opportunity. But I don't say it anymore, especially in the world we live in today. I look at my kids and I look at audiences and I say, I fought and you're gonna to have to as well. 
Find the right capacity. Find the right place. Use your strengths. God's given them to you. If you want to serve in the military, fantastic. If not, find another place to be civically engaged to fight. Because our moment requires it. And that's every age group. That's my dad, who's about to retire from being a high school athletic director. I'm trying to get him to run for state senate. He's like, Dad, he's like, Pete, I just want to sweep, sweep gym floors for the rest of my life. <laughs> dad, no. And we'll see. But I, I point to my parents and say, you've got so much more to give. And it's our time for everyone to step up. You guys are already stepping up. You're in the arena. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much. instincts are enough already for the endless wars and trillions of dollars and what do we get out of it. But I think his advisors wisely um, counseled him that a residual force is pretty important, otherwise the vacuum is going to be filled by Iran and Turkey and Russia. People that are not our friends and ultimately would like to use Syria. What do they want to use it for? What does Iran want Syria for? They want a projection platform to Israel. It's what they want. And so the, he understands that, they understand that, and I don't think they'll... But, but like... I think it's more of a, metaphorically speaking, we're not in Syria to be there forever. We're there because there's a strategic reason to be there, which I think in his mind is a difference. And I think it is a difference, as opposed to saying, well, we're going to plus up to 10,000 again when the problem gets worse. As far as re-election, I think we'll have the same problem in 2020 as 2016. Plenty of people who've been harassed and browbeat not to support the president, because publicly means you're going to be called out and shamed, and they will proudly and secretly go pull that, pull that lever. Uh, because how do you run against this economy? One, a lot of people say, uh, it's all about the jobs. Jobs, 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 it's the economy stupid. That's kind of true. I think we're in a cultural moment also. So jobs are huge, the economy is huge. When, you're, when your wages are going up and Joe Biden's saying, I'm gonna bring back the middle class, I'm like, well, we're coming back. <laughs> <laughs> like that becomes a tough argument. So the economy is huge for him and what he's done. And then the promises he's made and kept, which politicians almost never do. But then I also think the left's lunacy. Yeah. Let's let the Boston bomber vote. Yeah. Let's go, you know, let's abort babies that are born alive. Let's do all these, let's not stand with the state of Israel. Let's do all of that in contrast to what Trump represents. And people ask me, is he a conservative? I just say he's an American. He's a patriot. And right now, conservatism aligns perfectly with patriotism because so many on the left have rejected the idea of America and the premise. So he's got a sweet spot to fight on culturally, and I think that benefits him again in 2020. Yes, ma'am. Would you consider running for office, please? Uh, Fox currently pays better. I have a lot of kids. Listen, I actually ran for office once before in 2020. I was ran for the Republican primary for the U.S. Senate from Minnesota. I was back from Afghanistan, and I thought I knew things about politics, and I really didn't. And I got in. A lot, a lot of vets do this actually. They come back and they're eager to jump back in, and they jump in a little over their head. Uh, and I lost. I came in third at the convention. It was a big Ron Paul moment, and I was not their choice, proudly. Uh, so I got beat at the convention, and then he went on to lose 
to Amy Klobuchar, who's very popular in Minnesota now running for president, in the single greatest defeat in statewide history. So I was the biggest loser to the biggest loser. <laughs> Uh, but listen, I mean, God opens doors and God closes doors, and the best thing he ever did was, was not allow me to win there. I went on to start Conserve Veterans for America, or get involved very early. We built a behemoth of an organization uh, that's still involved today. The president has followed through on our, our reform agenda at the VA, uh, and I, through that I had an opportunity to become a commentator and land at Fox, which is something I never thought I would ever do. So I'm a believer in find what you're passionate about and do it, and God will provide opportunities when they make sense. If that were to be the case, it ain't gonna be Minnesota. <laughs> because I love Minnesota, I'm a huge Vikings fan. Like I love my family's there, I love it. But uh, it's pretty tough to get elected as a conservative in Minnesota. Okay, I'm gonna let Carl have the last question. Oh, thanks for that inspiring, insightful, really wonderful talk, and you got my vote if you run. <laughs> but I wonder if you could indulge me about something. I did a little Google search on you to find out who you were. And the internet is full of essays and articles all about what you did two months ago on the news when you said, I haven't washed my hands for 10 years. I love it. And even the Washington Post ran an article about it. I know, even our, one of the women who takes care of our kids came up to me and said, Pete, you're in the Brazilian newspapers. <laughs> No, so I mean, the fun part is Fox and Friends is a really fun morning show. Right. We do a ton of politics, but we have a lot of fun too. And so my co-host, Jenna Diabila, who I love, who just got named as a permanent co-host, she's great. She's kind of a germaphobe. Like she wraps her, um, she says this openly, so I don't feel bad saying it. She wraps her fork in napkins, and like when she opens food, she sanitizes her hands. <laughs> And then she did, and I'm like, I'll just like pull bacon out of my pocket and eat it, you know? <laughs> so uh, on the Saturday of that show, I said, we had, it was National Pizza Day, and I love Pizza Hut pizza, so they got me some Pizza Hut pizza, and they were making fun of me because they love all the fufu pizza, you know, like cauliflower or whatever pizza. And so I ate it, and then after the show, I stuck it underneath the couch. <laughs> Not the pizza, but the box. <laughs> And then the next morning I walk in and sure enough it's still there because they don't move the couch in between Saturday and Sunday. So as a joke, at the beginning of that show, I pull the pizza box out and I, I pull it out and I go, hey, it's National Pizza Weekend, guys. This is a old pizza. And I start eating it on the air. And then she starts going, oh, that's so gross. And I go, what did I say exactly? I said, oh man, don't worry about it. I, mean, I haven't washed, I don't even believe in germs. I said, I haven't washed my hands in 10 years. I, said, I can't get sick, I inoculate myself. I said, germs aren't even real because I can't see them. And so I'm joking on the couch, but they're laughing, we're all laughing, like whatever. And then pretty soon, there are, by the way, you know this, there are media matters, uh, there are left-wing groups, there are, there, there are people whose job it is, their entire job is to watch Fox and Friends, and specifically conservatives, take clips, Put them out of context and try to make you look bad. I get two or three after every show. And then they go through the left-wing interlips. This one in particular had larger cultural resonance. <laughs> because I denied the existence of germs. I said I haven't washed my hands for 10 years, including while I was in Afghanistan. Uh, so a little hyperbole maybe went a little far. And it bounced all over. I mean, I had government agencies saying, don't listen to Pete Hexa, wash your hands. <laughs> So, and I, some people are like, you need to apologize and say that germs are real. I'm like, I don't need to say that. <laughs> so, it's the lunacy of our media these days, sir. I appreciate the question. Thank you.